welcome to this edition of the print soft cover where we talk about a book that has just been released and we also do the digital release of the book and we discuss the book with the authors this time around we are going to be talking about a book called exprovement exponential improvement through converging parallels it's a fascinating take on how to rethink how industry sectors companies can rethink that the, the way they approach various problems they can think out of the box and come up with a lot of innovative solutions to their problems based on experiences that might seem completely unrelated but the authors in the book have actually done a fantastic job in bringing all of this together and explaining how various different things like say for example one would be uh, there's a parallel between formula 1 and health monitoring there's a question of how can we make a footballer as efficient as a microprocessor and like this there are several topics that the book goes into and it comes up with really really nice solutions as to how one unrelated sector can lead to improvements in another sector we have with us the authors uh, mr raghunath mashalerkar who is one of india's preeminent one of the most famous researchers and innovators that we have his reputation certainly precedes him and mr harj halatkar who is the founder of instill motion which is an innovation lab and so he also brings a lot of insight into how we should think about things like innovation so now before we start with the discussion i'd actually like to do a little bit of a a digital release of the book so here we have uh sorry i'm going to be messy with the wrapping uh but so here we have the book uh sorry yes here yeah. we have the book and it's going to be releasing on the uh, or it was released on the 24th and uh so now we have the authors with us for this conversation now the questions i have uh, sirs both of you you can decide which one of you is going to take which question but i'd like to start at the very basic we've heard about the term improvement and improvement is something that we've come across all the way from our schooling days where your teachers are telling you to improve and once we start working then they are telling you you know your bosses are telling you you need to improve and all of that but what is improvement yes uh, well improvement is uh, exponential improvement right. uh, i am a believer in exponentials uh, not incremental but disruptive uh, making it big and not small uh, increments and my previous book with penguin leapfrogging to pole vaulting which as you know won the best business book of the year award and yes become quite popular the very concept there itself was that we don't take uh, a jump up a few feet but we pole vault and the size of the pole is the size of your aspiration basically okay. so that is ingrained in that but i must admit that the term experiment was coined by my young colleague who is half of my age by the way in fact i must say for the beginning as a joke that we talk about converging parallels right parallel lines never meet so that's an oxymoron how can you make parallel lines converge all right that's the principle so right. you start uh, uh, relating the unrelated so as to say now the book itself has been written by two people uh, where it is again converging parallels uh, harsh is half my age by the way right so, <laughs> so he's quite young our backgrounds are completely different and everything so that itself was merging the parallel but i think uh, harsh is the architect of this very uh, concept has made massive contribution from concept to final uh, sort of uh, creation of the book i have worked as more as mentor as uh, from uh, someone who has been looking at Uh, big things from a big perspective and so on so i hand it over uh, to harsh now to but uh, before before harsh starts sir i think you're downplaying uh, the Absolutely. impact that <laughs> your contributions could have i mean you're so vastly experienced that Absolutely. <clears throat> right. yeah so uh, harsh please uh, go ahead 
Yeah, so firstly, you're absolutely right. He is downplaying. His contribution has been immense. Uh, but yeah, so the, the reason uh, the word improvement came in and was important was uh, while we were, uh, while innovation something we've been working on, what we've realized is <clears throat> uh, people didn't know, like I've been asked, can you tell me an innovative way of arranging chairs? And I said, no, innovation can't be that. So, which is why we found this need to come up with the term or work on something where improvement, but you know, it, it needs to be exponential. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that uh, you'd notice through the book is uh, uh, Dr. Mashelka brings in a perspective that's more uh, very high level in terms of even from, a, even from as far as policy level, uh, whereas I am a product person or I have, uh, and I'm, you know, on the ground working on uh, innovations. And that's how sort of we both come together um, and I mean, you know, that those are the two perspectives that meet through the book. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that actually comes out uh, very clearly because each chapter delves into what a particular company can do, uh, yeah. you know, to address a problem, but then also what kind of implications this has in terms of policy. Yeah. So now about the, the policy side of things, uh, do you feel that India has kind of reached a cusp of where we need to move from improvement to improvement, where it's only if we shift gears into the exponential side of things that we'll be able to achieve our true potential. I uh, would simply say that uh, we have been changing gears, as you know. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at uh, the number of startups uh, in 2016-17, yes. 45. Today, we talk about 90,000. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. All right. If you look at, for example, the unicorns, until 2016-17, we used to have one unicorn per year, a billion dollar right. market cap, as you know. In 2021, can you believe it? We had one unicorn almost per week, 42. Yes. That's an exponential. That's a change. And we have done it in other areas also. For example, since you talked about policy, if you look at uh, light emitting diodes, all right, yes. uh, its share about 10 years ago was just 0.2%. And they are very important for reducing the carbon footprint. Right. Within seven years, it jumped to 88%. How? Right. By the innovation of demand aggregation and then uh, uh, supply uh, uh, chain innovation and so on and so forth. So there are areas, and if you see, for example, uh, if you look at uh, 2017, February, we were 156 in mobile data consumption okay. among the nations. Comes zero, giving four rupees per GB and voice free. And in next year, within an year, we don't leapfrog from 156 to 100, fall wall to number one. And we are the largest mobile data consumption uh, Absolutely. today. And you have seen, uh, so I, I believe that there are certain aspects in which uh, we are moving uh, with a combination of technology and policy where we are taking these uh, big jumps. But in the innovation space, we need to do that. Because our innovations generally at a ground level have been incremental. We have been more followers rather than leaders. Yes. Uh, talking about entirely new technologies, entirely new breakthroughs. There are far and few between, so as to say. Mm -hmm. So the book actually wants India to be an innovation leader. You know, in the Global Innovation Index? Yes. We have moved from 83 to 40. All right. right. China moved within 20. Why can't we be in the top five, for example? And that requires breakthrough innovations, which will create radical yet sustainable transformation very rapidly. So the book aims at doing that by giving examples where people have done radical thinking and shifted. I'll hand over to uh, sort of uh, uh, Harsh uh, to sort of elaborate by taking one or two striking examples so that uh, the uh, listeners can... Uh, uh, sort of understand it uh, better. The point I want to make is that there have been radical transformations. Take, for example, uh, Henry Ford. Right. His cars were very expensive, the way he was assembling them. Mm -hmm. right. And then he saw a slaughterhouse where animals were cut, and there was an assembly line approach. Yes. 
because the, uh, the worker did not go to the parts. The parts came to the worker. And he loved that idea. And sort of he put that uh, together and created assembly line approach and the prices dropped. And, and that changed the game. Completely. That changed the game. Why can't we do that in India? And Harsh has picked up absolutely brilliant examples, captivating. And maybe, Harsh, you can talk about uh, uh, two or oh. three. The, right. Yeah. So uh, before we actually get to the examples, which I, I actually uh, do have some questions regarding them, there's one element which I think that we need to explain to uh, the readers, which seems to be very important to your idea of uh, improvement, which is the delta. Now, if if you could if you could first uh, tell us uh, quite uh, simply about what is this delta and how can we actually make the best use by recognizing what it is and using it. Perfect. Yeah. Harsh. So the delta is basically <clears throat> what we're referring to as the delta is basically the delta between what is and what could be. Right. Right. So as as long as you know those are defined, I and you know so the approach is basically set by the delta. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's always about how you're addressing the delta. Like we speak about this in the book. Um, you know, do you want to redesign the bicycle or rethink human powered mobility? Right. Yeah. But when you say redesign the bicycle, I mean the delta is obviously smaller because you already have set a few parameters in, in the person's mind, right? You you know where the seat is, you know how uh, it works, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But right. when you say human part mobility, it sort of opens your mind up to a whole new direction, which which maybe I want to see which parts of my body can move and generate some energy. Right. Yeah. So I I may redefine the whole thing. So that is where we speak about the delta as to you know that which needs to be addressed for improvement to happen. Right. Is your delta of an improvement or of an improvement is the question uh, we're trying to answer. <clears throat> right, I understand. And uh, huh, uh, sorry, yeah. If you and going back to what you're talking to Dr. Michelle Karvith about, uh, uh, you know, I I don't know if this is a policy level, but one thing I I in order for improvement to happen, uh, one thing that we try to do at our end, but I don't know. If, I mean, I, I feel like there's a lack of it in general, which is uh, this whole thing of an industry divide uh, is what sort of many times uh, pertains uh, improvement from happening. Right. You know, there's an example in the book we speak about, uh, which is uh, of a barber. About 35 years ago, this barber was sort of looking at uh, the oil spill that happened of Exxon. Yes. Uh, and uh, he saw an otter there where, you know, the but and around the otter, uh, the hair of the otter absorbed a lot of the oil around it. Right. And because he was a barber, he thought, you know, why don't I try this? And he sort of put a lot of uh, the hair clippings that he had into a stocking, uh, put in a uh, pond full of, not pond, but a pool full of oil, and it absorbed all of it. He yeah. then got patented, and even today, the, it is it is the method used for uh, clearing oil spills. Right? Absolutely. So it was by a barber who had nothing to do with oil industry. Uh, or the mining industry, and you know that that's that's what drawing parallels is about. Yeah, so it's so, first about uh, identifying the delta, and then finding drawing parallels. ways to yeah drawing parallels. Yeah. So. yeah, because initially when we started, I remember there was so much resistance saying uh, you should innovate in one industry, and I kept trying to say that. Uh, I I'm not I don't belong to an industry. Or we don't belong to an industry, and that's an advantage. Right. Because we're able to come up with a new perspective. But it's a hard one to digest in general is what I've realized. <laughs> yeah, so the, say, let's take the example that I had mentioned before, which is about uh, one of your chapters is uh, on how to make a footballer as efficient as a microprocessor. And yeah. this ties into this uh, drawing parallels uh, discussion that we are having because from what I can tell in the chapter, the answer seems to lie in finding a commonality between the two. And in this case, it seems to be in measurement. So if you yeah. can tell us a little more, like so what in measurement in football can make a footballer more efficient? No, actually more than measurement, it also focuses on like the strategy you use. Uh, right. Like in a microprocessor, the entire strategy lies in how can, you know, you make it smaller yeah. and how can you make it a lot more efficient? How can you make it a lot, do a lot more, right? So when this is taken to a footballer, what happens is, and that's what the Lister City Club did, is sort of uh, made players move less, but made them really effective 
and yes. conserved their muscles and so were able to play a lot more than other play other teams that were around right, right? it's more th that particular example of course they got into measuring as well but that particular example speak more about like the strategy that's used in making a microprocessor and how can that be applied to a football player right yeah absolutely right. and so like that you also there's a parallel you've drawn a parallel between uh, formula 1 and health monitoring uh, and it's like formula how... 1 and clean teeth and uh, clean teeth, yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. So, so, like how, uh, and now pit stops are something absolutely, they fascinated me ever since I started watching Formula One, yeah. how these people can work so quickly, so efficiently, with such pinpoint precision in such a high stakes environment. So, absolutely. yeah, so if you could tell us a little more about that. So, it was mainly the production uh, uh, unit of it. What happened was every time, uh, so in a... Uh, Toothpaste manufacturing industry. Every time they had to change the be the flavor or the mold of the mm -hmm. toothpaste, uh, it took them about two days to do so. All right, uh, because they had to cool it down and then you know it has to catch, catch up heat again. Effectively, it took quite a bit of time. Uh, and then somebody said, you know, in a pit stop, and some people can do it this fast. Like change the whole all four tires of the car, refuel the car in a matter of seconds. Yeah, what can we learn from there? So. Uh, a couple of the, the Formula One companies now are getting into this thing of, uh, you know, uh, consulting for large industries mm -hmm. and uh, in order to improve efficiencies, in order to make things better for them. In fact, one parallel that I personally had drawn in a project from the Formula One team is uh, back in the UK when I was interning, uh, <clears throat> there was a company that had come to the company I was interning with, uh, which was into uh, accounting and audit. Right. Right. And one of the things we very quickly realized is uh, they need, so the biggest thing about it is they need to be as efficient as possible, so as quick as possible and as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. The first battle that comes to mind is the pit stop. Absolutely. Right? It's the and, benchmark. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, we were like, and we've taken a team from that company to a pit stop of Formula One team and said, what can we learn from here? And there were immense learnings that came up from there. And these guys were able to increase efficiency almost three times. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So, there's quite a bit that happens uh, when you are able to, like, cater to uh, go to something completely unrelated and see what you can pull out of it. Right. So, um, now a little while ago, there was a, a one area of research that had really, really interested me. It was called uh, biomimicry. Yeah. Which is, you know, where you look at how nature is doing things and you come up with improvements to various technologies that we have based yeah. on what nature. So one example is that uh, when it comes to cello tape or sticky Velcro. tape, you, you Velcro is one example, absolutely. The other is a uh, sticky tape where you look at how the lizards stick on the wall and the geckos. And so gecko tape actually now is a product in the market. The other would be the ever moving shark skin because skin on a shark is constantly moving at a minute level and yeah. this helps it in preventing barnacles from forming and so you know using paint that mimics this and the bottom of ships could yeah. save them millions in terms of cleaning costs so is uh, have you looked at only you know industry to industry parallels or also have you have you delved into biomimicry a little bit uh, we have delved into biomimicry. In fact, I think the second chapter, if I remember right, is about how uh, insects can build a commercial complex. Right. Yes. Uh, so basically, it talks about how anthills are ventilated and how that remain yes. cool. Yes, just by design. And uh, what, what architecture can learn from it. Uh, while that's one of the things, you know, it will be interest of, of interest of you. When you go deeper into biomimicry, you'll also realize that uh, there are parallels being drawn, not just in products, mm -hmm. but also in services and systems. Uh, like a colleague of mine in, in the UK had done his research on how bacteria multiplies yeah. and how organizations can grow like how bacteria multiplies. So he had drawn a whole parallel about these two. And it was a very nice case study that he had. Right. And uh, no, absolutely. The biomimicry in itself is an absolutely fascinating area. And then the way that you've kind of brought it into this larger discussion of how we can draw parallels from seemingly unrelated things. I actually love the fact that, you know, there are 
various aspects that I haven't at all thought about before. Industries yeah. that might actually have similarities, but we actually haven't seen them before. And that actually really comes out in this book. And so I tell the readers again, if you're interested in things like that, then please pick up this book. One uh, example, again, that caught my eye and because I actually play quite a lot of the PS5. So it was the gaming chapter. Uh, so you talked about how advances in gaming have affected the way that we approach physiotherapy. And now is this, is this story now done? Because there are a lot of, uh, you know, movement based uh, games that we have and that technology is being used in physiotherapy. So has that also plateaued or do you see that they're still innovating in that? Oh, sense? no, no. There, there's a company that's doing really, really well. A couple of companies that are doing really, really well. In fact, uh, not just the physiotherapy where, you know, you can see the movements and sort of respond to it, uh, which is only one aspect of it. But, you know, physiotherapy for a lot of people also gets very boring. So right. the second and more important piece also that they've picked up from it is gamification of physiotherapy. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, the couple of companies are doing really well. So it's 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 growing really well. And, uh, you know, you also see one of our ideas that we, uh, we were trying to work on, we're still trying to work on, is uh, which go goes into the same chapter, is uh, sort of skill development through, uh, you know, these gaming consoles. Uh, so essentially, you know, if I have to show somebody how to cut wood or whatever, and I can monitor their movements. I see, yes. Right. So that's that's a whole other application of it that we're working on. Um, yeah. So I mean, parallels, like I said, from gaming to physiotherapy to skill development. Um, like I said, the moment, the more we are able to blur the walls between industries, the better the parallels and the more the chances of improvement is our take on the book. Right. And so now I'm going to actually then put uh, both of you on the spot one by one. Uh, so Mr. Uh, uh, Mashelkar, if you could tell me which of these concepts that you have put out in the book is actually your favorite, which would you say is the must read chapter? Well, it's like you're having 10 children and all of them. Being <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, but uh, uh, I would say this uh, uh, biomimicry based uh, observation that I made a particular favorite. You know, I am Sir Louis Matheson, distinguished professor yes. at Nash University for the last 15 years. And uh, one of my lectures uh, that I give every year is serendipity. Right. Chance observation, accidental observations. Because many breakthroughs in science have taken place, including penicillin, because of such breakthroughs. So I talk about organized serendipity. Now that's oxymoron. Serendipity right. is an accident. How can you organize the accident? And there is a complete description in terms of how can we make it happen. And bulk of my examples are from biomimicry, so as to say. How can you relate the two unrelated, like uh, silk fiber? In fact, I have theoretical papers on this, on how silk mm -hmm. fiber is formed. And you can imagine the polyester shirt that you may be wearing. The spinning is done at melt temperature, which exceeds 200 degrees centigrade. Right. Silk fiber generates it at room temperature. So what can we learn from the way the silk fiber is made to do processes at room temperature? Mm -hmm. So these have fascinated me. So like you, my favorite is also biomimicry. <laughs> Fantastic. And so for our readers, I would. Uh, it's chapter number four. It's titled, How Would an Insect Build a Commercial Complex? And uh, so yes, now Harsh, uh, what is your favorite chapter? If you were to name just one. <laughs> Uh, it possibly is the first one, the football chapter. Oh, the first one? Yeah. Not, uh, I see. So actually it would be uh, chapter number two because chapter one is yeah. they're talking about yeah. improvement. So chapter number two is how to make a footballer as efficient as a microprocessor. Why, uh, you're a football fan? No, uh, I just like how... So in general, I like when uh, analogies or parallels are very, very far away. Right. And I think Absolutely. that's the furthest uh, we've gone. Uh, in fact, talking about biomimicry and the book, uh, if you look at the last chapter, which is like a bonus chapter that we have, yes. 
uh, it talks Banyan about the Banyan tree analysis. Tree approach. Yeah. yeah. So the Banyan tree analysis is a is a method is something we use uh, while working on projects. Uh, but it is a it is a parallel with nature for a process, which is right. essentially. Uh, you know, if you look at a banyan, and I find a lot of similarities between how a banyan tree grows and how the process of improvement happens. Uh, if you if you see, it drops parallels, which are roots, essentially, at various different points to parallel to the bark of the tree. Right. And uh, the, when, when, you know, another root finds uh, a source of water, eventually that becomes a trunk. Yeah. So, so that, that whole chapter is a... But is a process biomimicry and processes of improvement, and that also is something that uh, I think you know has come out really well in terms of how the parallel worked. No, absolutely, and I I say this again. This this book is actually it should be in my uh, I mean my advice would be to make it uh, required reading in management schools at minimum. Policymakers should have a look at it. And uh, in general, it's a wonderful read for even the lay person. So please grab it in bookstores. The book was released on the 24th. And thank you so much both for joining us. It's been a wonderful discussion. And the book, of course, I would congratulate you. It's a fantastic piece of work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.